let's turn to a portion for today. We turn to Romans chapter 12. We read from verse 12, verse 9 to verse 18. Romans 12, verse 9 to verse 18. Let love be without dissimulation. Abhor that which is evil, cleave to that which is good. Be kindly affection to one another with brotherly love, in honor preferring one another. Not slothful in business, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope, patient in tribulation, containing instant in prayer, distributing to the necessity of saints, given to hospitality. Bless them which persecute you, bless and curse not, rejoice with them that do rejoice, weep with them that weep, be of the same mind one towards another, mind not high things, but condescend to men of low estate, be not wise in your own conceits. Recompense to no man evil for evil, Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible as much, life in you, live peaceably with all men. I start this by first referring to something that I might have said earlier. When we finished Romans chapter 11, in a long time, I had told people that once we finish chapter 12, we might quickly finish the remaining chapters. And people who know me understand the difficulty for me to something, to make things over very quickly when it comes to reading through the scriptures. So we come back to Romans 12, and today we will not go far. We'll stick with Romans 12, verse 9. Now, till now, we have come to the understanding from chapter 8 onwards that there is no condemnation to them who are justified by God. No one can accuse them. They are united on this earth with each other as they're dependent on each other. These Christians are part of each other. We read all of this last time. But one important thing which I would again want you to remember and understand and underline is this. That all that you read and all that you will read cannot be true for non-Christians. It cannot be true for nominal Christians. It cannot be true for people who are coming to church to just warm the pews or learn a new thing in theology. This can only be applied to a person who is a believer, who is filled with the Spirit of God. Now all that you find is true is only because the Spirit of God is working in you and that working is a fruit of the Spirit in you towards others. Now, we have a long list of things that Paul discussed in chapter 12 from verse 9 to the end of the chapter. Now, Paul had a very logical mind. He does not jump to a practical outworking of all that is written without a logical method in place. I'll tell you what I mean. See, many commentators have said that all that has been said till now or from now did not necessarily have a hierarchy in the list of things. I mean, they are saying that it's not that these things are not important, but it's all that all these things are equally important. Now, all things can be equally important is not to say that there need not be a hierarchy of things. All of these things, what you read here, all of them are not optional. They're all compulsory for us to follow. But the hierarchy would still be there for us to understand that what will follow from the next. Now, when we look at this, we look at four important aspects. Verse 9, we look at a very broad categories or categories. Here, verse 
9 speaks about how we govern our own life. That's the first principle that we start by governing our life, which is presented to others' lives. Second refers to our family duties, how we govern to those who are our brothers and to our work. Then verse from 14 to 16, we see our duties towards others, especially when things happen to us. What is the reaction when things happen to us? And the last section would be, what is the reaction to people who consider us as their enemies? But the starting point, as always, would be the most difficult one. And if we have to get through till verse 21, we cannot get through that till we cover the first one that is seen in verse 9. Let love be without dissimulation. Now we know that a Christian has love in his heart. How? Not because he has seen love around, not because he's a creature of the world, but because of Romans 5, 5 tells us this, that because the love of God is shed in our hearts by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. When was the love of God given to us? When the Holy Ghost gave it to us. When we believed in God. When we became a new creation. So this love of God is not something that we have generated. But God has given this love to us. But the question again comes in, how do you see this love? You remember the verse that when Lord was asked, what was the greatest commandment? And what, did, what was Lord's answer in Mark 12, 28 to 31? He said, you shall love the Lord, thy God, with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind, and with all thy strength. And this is the first commandment. And the second is like, namely this, thou shall love thy neighbor as thyself. When we are studying this, we understood that the first four in the greatest commandment, in the Ten Commandments, come into that first great commandment. And the last six of the Ten Commandments comes in the second part of the great commandment, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Now Paul is constantly reminding the church the value of the Ten Commandments. In fact, in 1 Timothy 1 to 9, what he is doing is this. He's actually explaining to us commandments. In Romans chapter 13, you'll again find the Ten Commandments listed there. In fact, if you turn to 1 Timothy 1 9, 1 Timothy 1 9. This is what you read. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayer. This particular list that you see here is actually the Ten Commandments given negatively. In Romans 12, 9 to 14, the commandment is shown positively. What do you do when it comes to God and when it comes to your brothers. But let's start with the verse itself. Let love be without dissimulation. Verse 9. Let love and let's stop. The word love used here is the Greek word agape. Now you have heard this often that in the biblical Greek there are many words that explain love. There are fundamentally four major words uh, that use one is a word called a storch or stog which means family love then there's a word called as filio which is usually used as love between friends then there is eros which stands usually for sexual physical love and then they say there is agape which is divine love unconditional love or a love of choice now this would be told to you again and again that the love of God is agape. This is unconditional love. We see a host of Bible verses like John 3.16, which says, God so loved the world. And the word there again is agape. And we say, see, God's love is agape. Human love is not agape. Now, 
forgive me for sounding too technical on on this subject but i i would want you to understand why the discussion on love is important and if we don't understand the word we might miss the whole point of the apostle so let's come back to greek on love now though the word used here is agape the question that we need to ask just for the sake of being truthful to the scripture that does agape itself mean divine love as against human love or love by choice now this can make good sermon appeals when we ask people that you need to love with god's agape love and not feel your kind of love now if you want to tell someone that we should love like god that makes perfect sense but when we tell people that god's love is agape and we should love like agape and not any other love that simply bad scholarship not to mention bad greek L- let me show you a-, a couple of things the agape does not show only divine love right for example when you read to matthew 5:43 you can just write it down and later probably you can check in any tool that you have matthew 5:43 the verse is remember love your neighbor the word again is agape again john 13 34 which says love agape one another ephesians 5 33 when it talks about loving your wife it's again agape he loves her with that agape i 1 john 2 10 anyone who loves their brother and sister lives in the light again the word is agape now you might again tell me yes brother that's the point agape love refers to a divine kind of love and so that these verses use agape love that we need to love our brothers with the agape love now i understand that sometimes it becomes difficult for us to move away from beliefs that we held for so long so i want to show you some other verses which shows that agape does not only stand for god's love by which we love each other but the word agape is also been used for sinful human love for example turn with me to john 3:19 which says people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil the word again there is agape people loved darkness the word is agape or john 12:43 which says for they loved human praise more than praise from god again agape second timothy 4:10 remember that they must love this world and he has deserted me they must had agape love for this world turn to second peter 2:15 and you'll find they have left the straight way and wandered off to follow the way of balaam son of bezar who loved the wages of wickedness again the word love here is the word agape i i wanted you to understand that the word agape in the bible is not a special kind of god's love it's a term which has been used for human love divine love wicked love also for example in the greek old testament that's called as a septuagint which was used in the time even of the lord agape is used to refer to amnon's feelings to his half sister tamar remember the whole incident of rape in second samuel 13 if you turn to matthew 24 12 you'll find agape is growing cold if it's god's love there is no chance of it growing cold you remember do not love the world again the word there is agape you want i want you to understand brothers that agape is not a special kind of love but was a common greek term used during greek greek literature the, during the time when the new testament was written a second point also needs to be made the word philio is not limited again to human love or brotherly love this is important because usually the difference is that humans love in the filio way and god loves 
in the agape way. Now that that really sounds very nice, but it's not true, right? Let's let's look at some examples. John five verse twenty. John five verse twenty. This is describing God's love of Jesus, right? The word is this: For the Father loveth the Son, and showeth him all things that he himself doeth, and he will show him greater works than these that ye may marvel. The Father loveth the Son. The word there is the word filio. The word filio is also used in passages like Revelation 3.19. Remember that? Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. Those whom I love, filio. It's God's love. John 16 verse 27, that, they, that says, the Father himself loves you, because you have loved me. The Father himself loves Philio because you have loved me. Philio again. I mean, that would rubbish the whole idea that when Jesus and Peter was describing and Peter was saying about Philio and Jesus was talking about uh, um, Agape kind of love, you'll see you have loved me, Philio, and that's the reason our Father has loved you. It was general language. In fact, the word agape and filio would appear as synonymous words. They are synonyms. They are used interchangeably. For example, Revelation 3.9 and Revelation 3.19, you can look back later, that both the verses speak about Jesus loving the church. John 3.15, 3.35, sorry, and John 5.20, both the verses one uses agape, one uses filio. Both describe that father loves the son. In fact, there's one verse that I want you to turn to. Matthew 23, verse 6. Matthew 23, verse 6. And someone can also turn to Luke 11, 43. Matthew 23, verse 6 you'll find the Pharisees love the most important seat. The word used there is filio. But in that same parallel passage in Luke 11, 43, you'll find the Pharisees love the important seat and here the word used is agape. These words were synonyms. They were not different words. So when the Bible uses agape, it is not a special kind of divine love. It is still God's love, right? Having understood that, let's move on. But we have still not solved the problem. You know why? Because till now, we have not come to a definition of love. And that is the most crucial part of this entire exercise. Because most people mix love with emotion or showing compassion. In fact, this problem gets very complicated when we have seen both the elect of God and the unregen unregenerate can love. The elect can also love and the Pharisees can also love. So what love is would be seen on how you predicate that love. What is the end of that love? Or love would land up being a word without any meaning. So the biblical love is sometimes diametrically opposite from the world's concept of love. And I, I, I want you to bear with me this, even though it looks like a long winded discussion, it's important for us to understand that why the concept of love in the Bible is so diametrically opposed to all that the world speaks about love. Now, for that, a few misconceptions about love, a few myths about love have to be broken. First, and the most common myth, love is not an emotion. Most people think that love is an emotion. That's a myth. Love is not an emotion. God is love. So now we are told, no, God has emotion. You know why? Because God has love. Now here's the problem. They think love is an emotion. And since God is love, God is emotions. They are not. 
I, I want specifically to remind young people here who are waiting to marry, waiting to fall in love. Love is not that sweet, twingling sensation in your heart when it skips a beat when you see someone. If that is happening to you, you need parental advice and good pastoral care. But that is not love. It's just your mind playing sin. Love is not an emotion. And apart from the difficulty of defining love itself, we understand that God cannot have emotions because emotion means something that keeps changing. Emotion is based on our lack of knowledge of things. I'll explain what it means. I became emotional. I become sad when I hear a news. Now the news made me sad because I did not know about what happened. If this is going to happen earlier, someone died. I learned about it now and I became sad. Similarly, when a happy news come to me, comes to me, I rejoice. Now you see, this change, this emotional change, is because I do not know all things. If I knew all things, there would be no change in me. God knows all things. You cannot surprise him or make him sad or make him happy. When the Bible describes him to us, it's basically telling us what he thinks about matters in the way we understand it. It's not to put those emotions to God. Love is not an emotion, far from it. Second, same type of love, second myth, same type of love can be exhibited by everyone, be he a saint or be he a, be he a sinner. Now this looks almost right, doesn't it? It's particularly because we've not defined the term love till now. You'll see the difficulty in Love, when I explain to you this particular emotion, what is the difference when someone tells you, I love my wife? And in the same breath, he'll tell you, I love a prostitute. Now, he can do the same things that he loves his wife. He can show care, he can do physical, emotional care to his wife. In the same way, he can do physical and emotional care to a prostitute. Both use the same word, love. But don't you understand? One is condemned by God and the other commanded by God. So here, the word love cannot be the same for two people. That's the problem that we're facing today. When people define love for money, or we have Evil men who come and tell you that homosexual love, love for a man to another man in physical terms is allowed by God because God is a God of love. Love cannot be exhibited by both these groups in the same manner. It is not the same love. Yesterday I was listening to a very depressing speech made by a man who pastors a church who openly says he is same-sex attracted. And he finds nothing wrong if someone is attracted to the same sex, maybe in love him, so long as there is no physical action done. It was even more depressing because a very well-known teacher of the church supported that nonsense of love. Do you see the problem? If homosexual love is sin, the love that the Bible talks to you about cannot be the same. Because if we don't say this, what are we going to answer to people who, who tell us you're wrong to say homosexual love is sin because God is love? And we surely say God is love. Do you understand the difficulty when we tell people you cannot kill children in the name of women's freedom? You cannot abort babies and you say, no, no, brothers, you do not have love for God's, for people. 
you do not have love for women you do not have love for their freedom you do not have love that's the reason you're worried about fetuses that's what they call them love of the world love that the world shows and the love that the christian shows are not the same they do not fall anywhere in the same category i hope you see the problem why we have to go through so much just to understand even before we started the word let love because unless you understand love the whole of the rest was makes no sense and that's the reason i started by saying without being a christian verse 9 has no advantage to you because if it is not god's love you cannot love your neighbor you cannot love your enemy you cannot love your wife or your children now many people tell me this that 1 corinthians 13 defines love no it does not 1 corinthians 13 shows us the characters of love because the definition of love still eludes us but let's see if god provides definition of love turn with me to romans 13 10 romans 13 10 therefore love is the fulfilling of the law love is the fulfilling of the law love is not an emotion love is an act of the will it's a decision or a volition to a particular acts action this action is required because we are accepting some statements some propositions some ideas and because those ideas are true we decide to act that's the reason christians when the when the lord tells you to love the primary motto the primary reason for love is the love stems out to the fulfillment of god's law i hope you remember one thing does the bible say love is god or does the bible say god is love there are many who tell you love is god that's not biblical that's idolatry but what biblical is god is love god is the standard of love and god and his law which he has given to us in love we find the fulfilling of the law of god so the love of god is a volition is a decision to follow the law of god to accept things which are in his law to accept what he says and reject what he hates there's a great deal of self deception at this time i i need to focus on that we always emphasize on love and on friendship and fellowship but trust me brethren this is not love people are simply fooling themselves this is exactly what paul says your love is not free of dissimulation it's a mere facade you're putting up your play acting because if love can be without dissimulation it can only be if you are a part and trying to fulfill god's law many people think about love and they confuse love with you know politeness or being likable or being someone whose words spill out kindness now what i want you to understand is this could be just a put on the love of god and being courteous a poles apart being courteous is taught in finishing schools children are taught in schools how to be courteous but they are not taught how to love god courtesy 
and love of God are two different directions. One is polite, but it could be just learned. But one does not start with the idea of politeness, but it starts with the idea that it has to fulfill the law of God. Okay, by the way, I'm not saying that being polite is a bad thing. Love, of, love as a fulfillment of the law is not opposed to the law, but rather does all things that law demands of it. The law of God is perfected. The love of God is perfected in the law of God. The love and the law of God are not contrasts. And this would be seen by right-thinking Christians. That I need to love because God commands love. I cannot command emotions. Do you see that? I cannot command, okay, now you have to cry. Or start laughing. Or be happy. Or be sad. Because even if you try to do that, that will be a put on. Love is a command. Emotions cannot be brought on command. So when the world speaks that about God loves the gay and blesses the gay kind of love, we can surely tell them this is not the love of God. This is not in line with the word of God. This is not in line with God's law. In fact, God judges this kind of love. So firstly, we saw that love has to be equated with the fulfillment in God's law. So if you think you have love, brethren, it should be thinking with God's law alone. Love is simply not something floating in the air, having its own existence without predicates. Love is not emotionalism. But look at what Paul continues. He says, let love be without dissimulation. He means this love cannot be pretentious. You remember John 14, 15? What does the Lord say? If you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Same thing, John 14, 20, 21, which is he hath my commandments and keepeth them. He is that that loveth me. John 14, verse 23, he again repeats this. If a man loves me, he will keep my words and my father will love him and they will come unto him and make our abode with him. Love is seen in your action. Your action towards the commands of God. Love is not seen in actions that go against the word of God. So if you tell someone that okay, this guy is helping and is a very helping nature and the whole point of his helping is to perhaps feed his own ego, perhaps do things against the word of God, that is not love. That's not godly love. 1 John 2, that's what John tells us. He that saith, I know him and keepeth not his command. He is a liar and the truth is not in him. You start there. But whosoever keeps his word in him, verily, is the love of God perfected. You want your love to be without dissimulation, without pretense? You should be in your heart saying with happiness, Oh, how I love the law of God. Your commandments are my delight. Dissimulation, pretense, fake is only done so that we attain something. So this is a concealed reason in the hearts. If someone tells you, no, no, this verse is about you. It is not about the love to God. This is about you talking. Here's the problem. You cannot love each other. If there is no love of God, no idea of loving what God has given to you as commands. 
dear wives you cannot love your husbands you cannot love your husbands if you do not love god dear husbands you cannot love your wives if you do not fulfill what god has commanded you to do in his law dear children you cannot love your parents because then you would love your parents only because you want things from them that will be dissimulation that will be pretense but you want to know the true love you have to stick to the word of god we love each other because it's a commandment given not convenience love has to be true genuine as some translations put it let your life of obedience to the commandments of god be whole hearted with no reservations it's not to please men it's not even thinking that i can please myself no the fear of god moves you you will not be a man pleaser if the fear of the commands of god moves you to fulfill god's command and that's your love you will not think of i would have to be man pleaser i would do things which people think is loving though i'm breaking the commands of god now do you know when people tell us things like that when people tell us no i am in love with that person whom the bible tells not to marry that person is an unbeliever but i am in love no it's not love it's sin because the first commandment for you is not to marry an unbeliever that's sin you are calling it as love but this love is a facade in front of god the chief end of man is to glorify god and if he finds any meaning of love as a volition it would be dependent on what god says about love in his word all human attempts at love will always fail because it's not rooted at the foundation of the law of god no matter how much you try to please each other if you and you try to find happiness in each other and when things go wrong since you are looking at happiness purely in each other and when the happiness is not fine is there people say no there is no love anymore that's the problem there is no love between you you do not generate love god does love is fulfilling of god's commands so are you caught up today in a marriage without love love god obey his commands but that's where love starts from you you do not find love in people you find love starting with you and then when you find love in you you know what has to be done let's look what the love does verse 12 chapter 12 verse 9 again let love be without dissimulation abhor that which is evil cleave to that which is good now many english versions or rather most english versions put this as three different sentences and so it almost looks like three different commands let love be without dissimulation abhor that which is evil cleave to that which is good now this is extremely bad translation even in the kgv because these are not three commands is actually part of the same first command in fact um, if you ever heard of this translation called as the li tv the literal translation version uh, it, it reads like this let love be without dissimulation 
in horror fleeing from evil and cleaving to the good if if i read it in if i try to in the kgv in this format it should be like something like this let love be without dissimulation abhorring the evil and cleaving to the good you understand what it says if you love the love will abhor evil and it will cleave to what is good you understand the impact of that loving is not simply loving things and just keeping quiet about things it is an action you abhor you hate what is evil you know this evil is interesting this word evil is not something that you dislike about you about your own self or dislike about someone's behavior no this word evil has a definite article in front of it you can read it as abhorring the evil cleaving to the good all the things that the faith tells us is evil that's against god all the things that side with god and god alone that we say which is good so the greek used here is you know to have a horror of evil when you are loving your love which is not a facade will run away will flee will hate will abhor evil this is an active opposition to evil because evil itself is actively opposed to god and god's law do you see how different this is from the world's definition of evil oh, sorry of love world's definition of love is no no you have to love everyone stop using the hate language stop using the negative language that's not the biblical idea love in it has the idea of hating something love by its virtue tells you to hate things if you still don't think so Turn with me to a couple of verses. Psalm ninety-seven. Psalm ninety-seven, verse ten. Which says something like this: "Ye that love the Lord, hate evil. Ye that love the Lord, hate evil." Amos five fifteen. Amos five fifteen. it says hate the evil love the good and establish judgment in the gate your love has to come out as hatred for evil the more you love god the more you will hate evil so when you see a person and the best example of you understanding that does he follow the law of god anything in him that does not follow the god, the law of god anything which is the evil your response in love will be to save him read jude 23 jude 23 it says something like this others save with fear pulling them out of the fire hating even the garment spotted by the flesh save with fear pulling them out of fire because you love them but what do you do with their sin hating even the garment spotted by the flesh in fact in the morning today do you remember the psalm that we read psalm 15 Paul starts. Sorry, David starts with what? Who shall abide in your holy hill? Right? Who shall abide? The right is. The focus of David should be what? I have to stay there. I have to be happy. I have to be righteous. So I'll stay there, right? But David does not stop there. Look at verse four. In his eyes, a vile person. is contempt contemptible whose eyes the man who is right is in front of god 
in his eyes, a vile person is contemptible. Do you see that relation? When you love God, hating sin, hating the evil, is not a choice given to you. Rather, if you're not hating evil, if that contrast is not seen in your life, you can might as well question, do you really love God? Do you are desirous of God? When you go back home, you can read the Second Corinthians 6. The Paul does this, this kind of a balance or a comparison of sorts, like God and Belial, righteousness and unrighteousness, light and darkness. There is no communion between them. You believe in light, you have to hate evil. So if you want to love God, if you want to love your brethren, you have to love each other, but you have to hate evil. Evil in you, evil in them. So when you hate evil in them, I'm again repeating, this is not some irritating behavior which you do not like. This is not a subjective idea of what I want. This is completely objective. This is not based on your reaction to something. This is not based on your subjective feelings and your and mind fallen nature. This is based on the objective idea that God has given on what is good and what is evil. Do you love your brother? If yes, hate any evil that he will have. Because if you support him in that, you're a part of that evil. If there's anything good in him, that good comes from God, love him for that good that God has given. So if your friend is in sin, not correcting him, Is a sign of love or the sign of disobedience to God's love, God's command? Do you see the difficulty God is putting you into by asking you to love each other? We think it's an easy commandment. Oh, we should love each other. Oh, where is love? My dear man, it's difficult. I have to look into you the way you'll have to look into me. I have to see you, love you, not to mention correct you. You remember the writer of Hebrews telling you this? Are you children of God or are you bastards? How do you know that you are not a bastard but you're a child of God? Is if you're a child of God, God will discipline you. God will bring you back to his truth, to his love. How difficult it is to love in the way God asks us to love. Because in his love, we have to look at these commandments to be done. But let's not forget the second part. Cleave. To what is good. The word cleave is a very interesting word. It's, it's, like, it's an idea that is like sticking two pieces of wood together with, with some kind of an adhesive. So here what he's saying, you stick to the good as if you're cementing yourself to it. Fasten yourself to it. That which is good is good in the sight of God. So here's what Paul tells you in verse 9. Love should be without dissimulation. It should not be in a pretense. Love will be loving all the law of God, fulfilling the law of God. It would not be a love which is pretentious. It will be a genuine love. It will be a genuine following of his commands, knowing what God is. And that love of God 
will make you abhor evil if it does not do that it is not love that love of god will make you cleave to what is good in your brother if it is not it is not love and do you see that work given to us to keep identifying in our life what is evil what is good in our brother's life what is evil what is good brothers we are an organism tied to each other we know our body parts don't we that's it with the christians we know what requires attention what is weak what requires strengthening what is sad and depressed today that's with the church let me again ask you how do you love is your love a facade to get good things out of each other or is your love for the glory of god that hates every form of evil and it cleaves to every good that god has given if you don't then your love is not the love of god but if it is the love of god be ready to pay a price for it the price is important because you will be looking at the whole law of god and denying a place for error having horror of evil both in practice and in doctrine is there a price to be paid yes it is because when the true love comes in and when you're looking at things they will often tell you there is no love and you'll be called up all sorts of things all sorts of names there's a price to be paid brothers for loving that's not new let it not surprise you in a world of thankless sinners this man comes down sinless not required to die but is still loved loving was difficult but he still did it how did he express his love he had to die for them that's what love demands it's not going to be easy love is not that pleasant meeting on a sunday morning and we crack a joke at each other it might show out like that but that's not about it it's about looking at the law perfectly asking do we love god in everything and we hate the evil we wish that evil was not there in me and I, and brother the one that i love i wish that evil is not there in you oh brother i see the love of god that you have i wish i could have that love cling to what is good true love always comes with a price always comes with a price this romans 12 verse 9 if it seemed like an easy thing for you i hope i have made it so difficult so scary but we still have to do it because god commands us to do it be ready to be called names because you're going to identify your love against the love of the world against the standards of the world you're going to identify your love with god's law 
let me end by quoting something from Spurgeon. Almost at the end of Spurgeon's life, he saw there were things that were going wrong in the church. After serving ministry for years together, he showed people their errors. Result, people tarnished him with accusations, blaming his behavior to his sickness and to his age. Spurgeon did not keep his foot down. He finally resigned. And he said something like this. With someone with the idea that people and Spurgeon was not polite enough or kind enough in the way he was dealing with people. Here's what Spurgeon said. Men are perishing. And if it be unpolite to tell them so, it can only be so where the devil is the master of the ceremonies. You know what Spurgeon is saying? Men are dying and you're telling me to be polite. Probably it's because the devil is the master who's organizing all this event. Men are dying. It doesn't call for politeness. Then he goes on. Out upon your soul, destroying politeness. The Lord gives us little honest love to souls. And this superficial gentility will soon vanish. I could with considerable refreshment to myself pour sarcasm after sarcasm upon religious covetous. I would cheerfully sharpen my knife and dash it into the heart of this mean vice. There is nothing to be said in its favor. It's not even humble. It's only pride of too beggarly a sort to own itself. It's not even humble. It's only pride of too beggarly a sort to own, to understand itself. May God keep us from pride and false humility. But let us love without a dissimulation, abhorring the evil and cleaving to all that is good. Let's look to the Lord in prayer. Father Master, we thank you for all that you've given to us. Hearts which were stoned, melted by your spirit. Love poured into creatures who can only love evil. Love poured into creatures who now and for eternity will not stop thanking you. Love, which is greatest example, is that man of Calvary who fulfilled the law. Love, which makes me abhor the evil. And love, my brethren, and cleave to what is good. Oh God, we confess, Master, that this word love has confused us enough and confused the world that we are living in. Help us, Lord, to understand there can be no good apart from you and no love apart from you. Tie us to your word, Lord, to your law, Lord, as it were, that we dream also that we can purely love our brethren, cleave to everything good which your word tells us. We're also having horror for our sins, 
for our roles. Thank you, God, for these words, for the time, for helping us all be together, even in our houses together, to learn from your word. Thank you, Master. In your son's name, we offer this prayer. Amen.